Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're here thanks for Profit Master Global Outsourcing, providing premium offshore solutions. Now, during today's chat, uh, if you've got questions, thoughts, ideas, we've got the chat bar down there. I'll be monitoring that. So if you've got any questions throughout the session, please throw it in there and we can have a look at it. Although I will allow time as well at the end of this um, for any questions you may have. I am still admitting everybody, so I'd Apologies if I go off this way, because that's what the screen's telling me to do. So we've got about 45 minutes um, to 50 minutes of what we're going to talk about. And we're going to be talking about our topic, which we've done for the last two sessions as well, which is about offshoring, but more importantly, about how you can continue to build your global workforce. So this time, and I know everyone has probably just had a quick chat to Richard Croker just then. So uh, our panel for this particular session, we've got founder and CEO of Profit Master Global, Richard Croker. Rich, how are you? Good, mate. Very well, thank you. Fantastic. We've got a special guest today. We've brought in Rachel McKenzie, is the Operations Manager for Loans Gallery. How are you, Rach? I'm good. I'm good, Paul. Thank it's you good. for having me. It is. A few, uh, few familiar faces here for you, uh, Rachel. Yes, I know. A very <laughs> warm crowd. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, look, this is our third panel session. Um, so if you've missed the first couple... Just jump onto YouTube, type in Profit Master Global Outsourcing, and up will pop up the channel. And there's, you know, the two previous sessions are both there. So if you want to go back and have a look at them, please, please make sure you do. The four key points we're going to talk about today are going to be around regulatory and compliance. We're going to talk about data and cyber. I know even we spoke about this at the Profit Master Conference, infrastructure, and we're going to talk about management and communication as well. So how will that adds to Sorry, I've got a few more coming in here. How all that adds to your, again, your planning off your global workforce, which again, this is the great part about this. So you're going to have Richard that you can throw questions to. And with Rachel coming on board from Loan Gallery this particular month, we'll have the ability to tap into Rachel's mind into how she's actually gone from one team member to four team members, the thought process of how a 15 member can work, um, the pros, the cons, the lessons, We'll reveal all of that today so all of you can learn from that. Let's get into this. So, Rich, I'm going to start with you, mate, because I know there's been a bit of a consistent message over the first couple of panel sessions, which has been about the recruitment process. And I know um, I get questions quite a bit, but I know at the conference that we've just been talking about, the annual conference for Profit Master, Dealey McKenzie, who Dealey's online, I think, as well. I saw a pretty little face come up before. Um, she spoke about the top five reasons to offshore. And there was one particular slide that got my attention, which I know that when she's presented this, we've spoken about the comparisons in costs. And I know while there may be some other factors, we're going to talk about data, we're going to talk about security, we're going to talk about infrastructure, all of that today. But cost does play a major factor in that. One of the things that Derek also mentioned in our last couple of sessions was around if you're searching for your global team to treat this like an onshore process, um, is that the fair expectation in terms of recruitment for any offshore provider? Paul, oh. for the type of offshoring that we provide, it is definitely the case. Yep. So if, if, if you are a, a client coming to us uh, looking for a candidate staff member for uh, good reasons about, you know, quality of staff, um, ability to work in the time zones, you know, all the usual things that we talk about, and price is then part of that. That's that's exactly the way that you need to treat it. Um, it's interesting in the Hayes um, uh, Employment uh, Review for 2024-25, the CEO actually wrote an introduction there and was talking about the continuing shortage of staff in Australia Look, talking the way around through my clients, it's continuing for the next few years. So um, in Australia, particularly in the professions, we have to look for a talent pool um, which is beyond the places we would normally look. Now, that doesn't mean we have to change our recruitment goals um, or our recruitment processes. It's just in a geographically uh, different location. So in answer to your question, the it's yes, you know, recruit just the way you would recruit in Australia. What you have with ProfitMaster um, is you have a whole recruitment team behind you and you have an HR team behind you. You have all of the 
uh, testing that we do of staff before they come on board. In many respects, the uh, the review that we do of our staff in the Philippines probably um, exceeds the level of, of pre-employment review that most employers would do in Australia. Yeah, I think that's an important factor because I, you know, and I think, you know, we're happy to take Rachel's thoughts on this as well, but um, most small businesses don't have a HR department, you know, and I think as you get bigger, I know Martin's online and, um, you know, from a whole Chadwick point of view, as an example, yeah, they may have a HR division, but there's also 500 team members. So I think the ability when you're a smaller team, sorry, a smaller business that is looking to grow, looking at that global workforce, the elements that are involved in that, even just sometimes to come up with a position description or a job description, they're the sorts of things as we're looking to grow that helps in that process, doesn't it? Yeah. From my um, point of view, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Rachel, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Over no, you. no, you're fine. I think um one thing I can touch on is, yeah, again, <laughs> like you said, Paul, we as a small business at Loan Gallery, again, we don't have that sort of HR, um, HR group really. So yeah, Profit Master, as um, as Rich said, very much um, they did the screening process and we were kept regularly up to date and the amount of candidates were actually pulled but then screened out very early on, um, yeah, really proved the due diligence that went into it. Yeah, certainly, certainly very, very important. I think that's the that's a critical thing. So whether or not you, again, wherever we're recruiting, I suppose the point that we're trying to work through is that make sure you're finding the person that suits, sorry, they're searching for the person that suits your business. And I think that's a critical factor. Yeah. Rich, um, I, you know, I mentioned cost before and I know it's, and I probably dearly have probably hear this a little bit more in terms of, uh, it's a, you know, usually a key decision-making criteria. Although the one that I hear a lot is around data protection. Um, from all the different businesses that I've often spoken to, data, cybersecurity being number one, cost is maybe number two. Is my data going to be safe? How do you safeguard against the cyber attack? Um, I saw there was an internal, interesting, they call it a cyber attack, but it was an internal one at Qantas only this week, which was interesting. We'll leave that for another time to talk about. But tell us how you've invested in your you know, how the protection of the data is there to protect any sort of business knowing that, you know, to protect any data or cyber security. Yeah, over the years, we're 10 years in the business now. And uh, right from the start, obviously, we had uh, uh, IT security in place to uh, protect against cyber threats. Uh, over the last few years, um, it's really become, possibly since COVID, but before that, um, it's really become a major and critical, uh, critically important issue in the uh, in the operation across borders. Um, in fact, during the COVID period, many companies were caught unawares with inadequate IT security at a local level in Australia, and uh, it, it was a good time for security advisors to come out and say, "Well, listen, maybe you should think be thinking about your data protection with all of these people working from home." We're already well ahead of the curve in relation to that, but. We also wanted our people to be able to work from home uh, during the COVID period. So, uh, so we actually spoke with um, uh, CT Group uh, with with uh, James Hay, who also joined us over in the Philippines. And James gave us some great ideas around how we could develop our um, our IT security infrastructure. And it was basically around uh, uh, ISO 27001, which is the standard, the international standard on. Uh, on IT security. There are about five components to that to make up uh, proper internet security. Um, and that was quite a heavy investment. I think we spent about 250,000 Australian dollars upgrading our security uh, during and uh, immediately post COVID. That was with um, hardware updates, hard hardware improvements and uh, software and uh, applications installed for security. Sorry, I've still got a cold that I've had for over a week now. I apologize. <laughs> so, um, so yes. It is one of the first questions that people ask you, particularly when they've never dealt with it before. Help me understand how my security is safe. And uh, look, I could go into a great long dissertation on how we do that, but I don't think that's what's required here. Um, certainly when somebody comes to join us, we will give them an understanding of, of how our IT security infrastructure works. Rach, I might throw to you, being a, being a client, of course, of Profit Master and how important was the data and cyber aspect to Loan Gallery? 
Yeah, obviously, um, data protection is a huge thing, especially being in the mortgage broking space as we are, um, the kind of client data that we have, but also that we're obliged to keep for at least a seven year period means that we really need to ensure that every data, every piece of data we have is um, locked down, really. So, um, again, it was a key focus when we were looking at an offshore group um, to, again, go through our aggregator and um, the fact that Profit Master in itself was a group that our aggregators suggested to come on board means they've already gone through quite a rigorous check and balance system. Um, but again, as well, having them tie into our onshore IT team as well um, and just knowing, obviously, um, the Profit Master team, having someone in their IT team um, that we can go to directly for any concerns and queries um, is especially helpful um, as well because I think it's, yeah, Mark, I've had a few conversations with if ever there's any IT or anything like that. So just knowing that anything we need can be addressed really quickly is helpful. Um, I just I saw the question pop up as well just about which aggregator. Um, AFG is who we aggregate under at Loan Gallery. Very good. You beat me to it. Um yeah, you did beat me to it, so that was good. I was keeping an eye on the questions as well at the same time. And I think that's a, that's an important point, isn't it, in terms of just making sure that it works in with what you're looking for and how, like you just mentioned before, seven years is a fairly long time to keep data as well. So how have you found that process to work for you guys? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously we've got certain parts where we need to lock things down, um, limited visibility and everything like that. Um, we do have our IT group in Australia that we um, use and they worked directly with the team at um, Profit Master. And again, any time that there's any changes to like the security levels or different um, internal files or anything the team needs to see, it's always a process where... Profit Master will double check, our IT guys will double check um, and then just give us also the mitigants of, okay, if it needs to change, this is what we can do. Um, and again, as well, just things really basic, like having the computers and everything cleared at the end of each day, making sure that anything that's been quickly downloaded to move from one file to another, um, such little basic things like that, that we know is sort of insured with Profit Master that might be overlooked by the groups. Like that's such a key piece that I think is somehow missed. But yeah, even an assurance like that um, in the grand scheme of things is really important. So that's a good point you just raised because when, when you're talking about, you know, the old saying, I'll get my people to talk to your people, that at the end of the day, it really is, isn't it? So your IT guys, whether they're in-house or they're an external outsource party, um, and we mentioned CT Grip before, Rich, so perfect example, they would talk directly to the Profit Master IT people to make sure there's alignment yeah, exactly. Let the people who know what they're talking about speak directly to each other and then it's just checking off if everything's aligned with what we want. Okay, brilliant. Rich, if I'm I could just add to that, Paul. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So our engineers over there, um, we, they work on a ticketing system and this is available for every client, mem client uh, staff and clients, that if, they ha if there's any question regarding our, uh, our IT connectivity, our any of our hardware, any of our infrastructure, any of our security, those guys are able to deal with it in real time. There's no hold up in saying, oh, you know, I'll get the IT guys who handle this to, to actually look at it. These guys work in the office. They, they work full time with us and then work with our clients, of course, directly. You just send a ticket and they deal with it. Yeah, brilliant. I think this is the, this is the risk aspect I sort of want to have a conversation about next and you know, I've heard um, I've heard some companies talk about, oh, look, I'll do it myself. Um, I'll engage people directly. Let's talk about the risk in terms of not only in terms of data and cyber, but also what about the major risk in terms of regulatory and compliance, which is that something you can talk about? Sure. Um, um, so let, let's talk about how we mitigate those risks in the office and then how we uh, how we compete with uh, other direct providers. So somebody working in their home, for example, is providing some sort of service to an accounting firm in Australia. Okay. Um, the, the first thing is that um, all of our machinery is covered by the Profit Master Security Overlay, which includes 
uh, monitoring and checks automatic responses back to us if there are any problems with the machine or if there is any improper activity in the machine. So <laughs> everything is very closely or capable of being very closely checked. And it's not about uh, spying on our staff. It's about if something goes wrong, we want to be able to go back and see what, what went wrong. And we have the capability to be able to do that, as well as being able to watch it in real time. And we have had cases there uh, with a work from home person who had just started with us and was 48 hours into the job. And we found that they were access or <laughs> they had access gaming sites on that particular computer. So they got around some things. But even the fact that they got around it, we were able to see what they'd done and they were gambling into the night. And then the next day they'd get up and they're too tired to be able to do their work. So unfortunately, that person didn't last very long. But that's that sort of thing we have to be able to do. The other thing is that at, at, a, um, at a really practical level, the Philippines has a lot of um, uh, things that just happen in nature. So, so volcanoes, hurricanes, uh, floods, um, all of that sort of stuff. Within our office, we're located in an area which is a higher area compared to other areas around uh, the Philippines. Uh, we have an international airport for getting people in or getting people out. Um, we have a, 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 an instant generator that starts to keep us electricity. It's a um, it's it's very close to an air base, so it's a very secure location that we're working in. That sort of thing adds to the uh, adds to the security for the people who went there the other day. You see that you walk in through the door, and there's a guard at the front door to be able to access. You go upstairs to the office, and you need a thumbprint to be able to get through the door. And even then, you're not into the into the operating area. So that's the level of physical security that you've got. Now, if I could couple that with a talk that um, that um, uh, Matthew Leighton Daly, um, Dr. Matthew Leighton Daly from Sydney University gave when he was at uh, at the conference, and he was speaking about um, uh, anti-money laundering legislation and uh, uh, anti-slavery legislation as it is affected by, by money laundering. Now, as part of the security systems that we have, we do a, a local police check, we do an international police check. That's in addition to the health checks and everything that we do like that. Whereas if you've got somebody working from home, all of those things that I've just spoken about, right up to the risk of money laundering, anti-money laundering, for which we in Australia have to take responsibility for our actions there, Right up to that, it's covered with a professional provider like ProfitMaster, whereas somebody working in Australia, unless they know what they're dealing with, is unlikely to have considered all of the implications of actually hiring directly. Very, very important. And Michael Partis could probably make a couple of notes on that. I mean, I mean, he's um, he's working that area quite significantly. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think the the, the ability for... And they're, they're, that's why I raised it, because I wanted to sort of chat about it in terms of the, the people that believe they can do it themselves and one of the other things we spoke about as well only a few weeks ago when we we're up there was because someone asked oh um, do you need to have a local director to have to be a director of the company the filipino company and the answer was yes as well so well that depends on the type of company that you've got okay but i noticed that we've got our lawyer with us he might like to answer that question <laughs> sorry are you there Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, the, you're correct. Uh, it depends on the company. Uh, as a general rule, foreigners can own up to 100% of companies. Um, uh, there are restricted uh, activities like you know, ownership of land, uh, mass media, education. But uh, if you are engaged in a BPO business, then you can own it 100% if you're a foreigner. Okay. Is that the okay. question? Yeah. Mm. That means one director only. One director only. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right now, the under our revised uh, corporation code, it could be a one-person corporation. Um, there's just some difficulty in that. Um, uh, if you're uh, if you'll be based in the Philippines, that's no. Uh, then a one-person corporation, you know, is perfect for you. But uh, if you're based in Australia, for instance, and uh, you have a one-person corporation, you know, there are a lot of documents that you have to sign, like uh, you know, um, you know, for for purposes of opening banks, you know. Uh, um, entering into contracts, so that 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 just makes it difficult to sign. But uh, of course, that's allowed. So okay. yeah, I know. If you if you uh, if you have a residence in the Philippines, uh, like a, an authorized person in the Philippines, then that could sign documents. Then uh, a one person corporation would be fine. Okay, that is very very good to know. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Graham, did you have a question there? I saw you uh, just about to poke up. Oh, it's just a comment. Uh, when I spoke to Tony the other day, uh, he was also mentioning that if you've got a, a company already established in Australia and you want to have a uh, like a subsidiary company over there, you can actually appoint a resident agent. So maybe you'd like to touch on that as well as an alternative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to set up a domestic uh, Philippine domestic company, an option is for you to set up a branch office. It's a branch of the of the of the foreign company. So in which case you only have to as a, appoint a resident agent. So he's not a director; he's just a resident agent for purposes of receiving, you know, uh, you know, official Philippine Philippine documents or subpoenas. So so then then that's an option if you want to set up a, a branch in the Philippines. That's also allowed. You just have to appoint a resident agent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really good information there. Thanks, Toddy. And thanks, Graham. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Um, Rich, staying on, I suppose the let's 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 move because there's a little bit of that was about the the infrastructure side. So let's let's talk about that. And I think the there's obviously been again we spoke about or you spoke about the investment. Let's talk about the investment that you've made into. You spoke about the office before, um, the infrastructure in. Most people, I don't know, I was surprised. I know when I went there last year, I was surprised at the um, the way the office was set up, the the professionalism of the office, the equipment, the space, the security, all of it, and the management communication that works with that, which what you've set up. How important was that to you and to clients like Loan Gallery to make sure they had that in place? I'll, I'll go to you first and then I'll ask Rachel as well what her thoughts were. I know Rachel spent a couple of, well, she's had two trips there in probably the last 90 days. Actually, I'll be interested in Rachel's uh, comments as well. <laughs> when when we first set it up, um, we were in a, uh, uh, we were actually outside the Freeport zone and then we moved into the Freeport zone and we're now a an international company uh, working inside the Freeport zone. And uh, that has certain benefits and uh and has allowed us to develop the business in the zone we work with a uh, a company over there who is a a uh, our landlord it's a company called bertha phil uh, they've allowed us to grow from a uh from uh i think we had 50 seats then then it was 75 then 100 and now we're in a spot where we've got 200 seats available to us um, and each of those, uh, we had the main office then during COVID, we grew very quickly. We had an annex, then another annex, and then we combined all of that into a thousand square metres where we are now. And uh, as you say, when you walk in there, that's just like walking into any office, uh, any quality office in Australia. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people think when they come to the Philippines that you're working in a, a call centre type environment. People see on TikTok you know, pictures of scammers, photos, pictures of scammers being fought out and all of this sort of stuff. It's not like that at all. It's like an accountant's firm anywhere in the world. It's like a broker's office anywhere in the world. Um, it's it's a quality setup, quality equipment, um, quality management. Um, and, and from that, we get quality staff and quality clients. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that we have set that up. It's not only a debt-free business, um, and uh, as I said uh, in, a, in a presentation recently, it, it's it's a very cash positive business. We have uh, great financial resources within the business, um, but we have great management too. And the management, uh, we, we've worked with management who are purely Filipino. We've never had Australian management involvement in the Philippines other than myself. And uh, our Philippines management does a fantastic job. Um, and uh, Rachel has been the person who's been the beneficiary of that, as well as I see we've got at least one other client with us, um, two two clients with us. <laughs> they have been the beneficiary of that, and uh, and from that you get great staff. You know, that's what comes with uh, with setting up a good business. Yep, I'd agree totally. Um, and I think that was the for for most of us that went last year, and then again this year. Maybe I don't know. It feels like it was only four or five weeks ago we were there. Um, I, I would agree 100%. Rachel, how important was that to you, um, let's say, from a, from a client perspective? Yeah, I think um, one of the big one of the big drivers for us to use ProfitMaster was, again, making sure that um, the 
values of the company were aligned with valuing our staff and taking care of the people who are taking care of our business and taking care of our brand. Um, and so, yeah, as as Richard mentioned, as you walk into the office, it's very secure. Um, I obviously went over there to do some training with a new team that I'd brought on. It was a new process. And so we did some pretty in-depth training, but again, was able to set up in a boardroom, making sure like, there was a shared screen that we could go up and use. Um, and again, as you walk into the office, it's as standard as any office that you get. Um, there's the personalization on people's desks as well, um, which it, like I think that actually speaks a fair bit. People see the value in where they work and they want to make it their own. Um, seeing that on every desk as you walk through, everyone's bought something from home. They've made themselves like a name badge with the company that they're BPOing for. Um, it was, yeah, it was a really good setup. And again, as well, um, Profit Master having the lunches and everything like that means there is that social aspect too and that culture, which again is really important. Did you enjoy the lunches, Rachel? I did enjoy the lunches, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, I know when you were there, they were doing their very best to look after you. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of lunches, <laughs> lots of sweets. The um, yeah, I don't think I've ever eaten so much sugar in my life since <laughs> when I'm in the Philippines. But yeah. yes. that's why you handball those um, those mango pieces over to me because you said you were done. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and that's that's an important one. So just for, just for everyone online that doesn't actually know that, Rich, um, you provide lunch every day. Is that right? Yeah, there's a caterer who comes in. They get a menu at the beginning of the week. And it's it's a fixed menu. There's five or six meals on there, seven or eight, I don't know, and uh, per day. So so four or five per day, and then they just uh, select from the menu. They put it in at the beginning of the week. If they don't put it in, uh, they, there's a default serve, so they still don't miss out on a, on a meal. And uh, so everybody gets a meal. That's part of that's because they start work so early in the morning. They start at six thirty. Some of these guys have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to come to work. Yep. So uh, it's just a way of looking after them. But I suppose it's the it's the the old scenario. That's right. It's about giving them a quality space to work from, um, quality equipment, lunches, and I think your comment before was well, it, it helps us to attract the right type of people. That would then mm. helps the clients to you can fulfil the the project if they're recruiting for a specific person. And again, they had all these little add ons that goes a long yep. way to also keep them for a very long time. I, I just on that point, Paul, I'd, I'd mentioned the times that Rachel goes over there to spend time with the team face to face. That's the stuff that builds those quality relationships. I mean, it, it's OK to be walk, talking through Zoom and stuff like that when you when you're on a day to day basis. But there is nothing better than being able to fo face to face eyeball the people that you're working with. That's not only from the client's point of view, working with the staff, but it's also from the staff's point of view, working with the client. And you know, we we had that um, we had our tenth year gala party the other night. Now, the, Rachel was there, and I believe you had a very good time, Rachel. Um, but you know, those staff were just so proud to be showing off their workplace and their work colleagues and everything like that to their client. Um, you know, Michael was there. Um, uh, Graham didn't make it. Delia was there. Who else was there um, from this group? Oh, DMAC, you were you were there, mate. Um, you know, they were just so proud to be showing the place off. And, you know, by the end of the night, we're all dancing together and carrying on. It was a great vibe that night. So, Rach, I might come to you on that because it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point and the importance of doing what you did. And um, to start off, though, let's are you OK to share a little bit about Lone Gallery, um, a little bit about what you do? and how you initially engage with Profit Master to build out your global workforce, which has obviously gone from one to now four team members? Yeah, of course. So um, Lone Gallery, we're a mortgage brokerage based out in um, Melbourne. So we currently have, I think, 31 brokers that work under us on a mix of salaried and contractor models. Um, and so I um, I came in um, to the operations manager role sort of this year, um, but there'd been attempts previously to build out an admin team. Um, but the thing with mortgage processing and loan admin is it is very 
monotonous and it is very time consuming, attention to detail, um, and isn't generally a um, isn't generally a role that people will stay in long term. It is something that people want to sort of develop and grow out of. Um, and so, yeah, trying to find team members previously just haven't really worked and a lot of time it's actually been left rather than the business as loan gallery building out a team to then offer the contracted brokers or the salary brokers. It was on the contracted brokers to find their own support if they wanted some. Yep. Um, which again, obviously for loan gallery in itself meant that it was um, a less job that managers had to do. Brokers were then, they had their staff and they um, would engage directly with BPOs or hire someone onshore. Um, now, obviously this model, um, brokers are good at broking. Um, they can write alone um, with their eyes shut most of the time, but when it comes to training, um, training a staff on process and sometimes from the ground up, um, it's not a skill set that they will have. So um, Loan Gallery came to the decision that they wanted to have another crack at building up the admin team and using um, offshore, um, like an offshore provider. Um, so again, we talked to a few different companies um, and then we had a chat with Delia. Um, and yeah, that was sort of the end of last year and the decision was made pretty much pretty shortly after the conversation that um, Profit Master was who we wanted to work with. Um, and so from there, it was really, we had sort of our workflow and processes in place, but it was sort of more so fine tuning those systems and processes. Um, and again, making sure, um, because obviously, as we've um, spoken about Delia, it is, and Richard, you've mentioned this as well, it's very um, task orientated, clear instructions is really um, what's going to help admin staff as they're training up to really succeed. Um, so, yeah, the time was spent building that out and obviously bring on um, the staff members to do the admin, um, training them up as well. Um, because it was a process that we were quite used to, we were able to do a lot of that training um, online and having me be the go-to. Um, so rather than having brokers taking time out of their busy day to explain a concept, they can get a task from a broker and if they're unsure, I'm their go-to to help with training and things like that. So. That's sort of where we've built out that model there. Um, and like you said, we've brought on um, the other staff as well and now we're at four staff members. Um, and yeah, again, as I as was mentioned, I came over to do some training for two new staff who were learning a whole new process. And at that same time, I also did some training with our existing admin team. Um, just going through concepts, I asked them to send me a bunch of questions they had in advance, anything they're unsure of and really breaking down the granular even just things like how do you buy a house in Australia, which is something that's not a part of their role and so obviously isn't generally a part of what the training documents explain, but really breaking down the concept so they feel like they've got a full understanding, which, um, again, if you're trying to hire someone as one broker who just needs to do a few tasks um, can be overlooked. Um, so, yeah, we've had a very good opportunity to build out and support the team um, as we are at the moment and, we're at the point where they've been on for, they're coming up to almost, you know, we've hit out over six months and sort of as we're pulling into the next six months, we're talking about, you know, like training progressions, areas of role they enjoy, things they want to learn that they're not capable of yet just because they haven't learned it. Um, and so we've built out our upskill and training progression plans for them, which is exciting. So again, just give them more responsibility because like I said, for, um, loan processing and admin roles, it is something that can be quite monotonous, um, but some people don't want to take that extra step and responsibility. They want to just move from maybe doing it in mortgages to doing it in a different industry, whereas we're quite lucky that with our team that we've got, they want to continue to grow. And again, they've really got the buy-in for the loan gallery brand and they're very proud of the brand. And again, I think, as Richard said, coming over, meeting them in person, having the, like, going out for lunch, having them give me all the Filipino street food and all of those kind of activities has, again, built culture in the same way you build a culture in an Australian team where you have your you have your events you go to, you have your meetings, you celebrate the wins. Um, yeah, just making sure that we're consistent with the culture that we build both onshore and offshore. Well said, well said. So how, how often would you talk to your team how often would you meet with your team um how often would you structure training with your team yep so i do a um with our two admins that are sort of 
moving into the um, second six months with us. Um, I, we do a training um, once a week with an hour block and we've got a shared document that we go through where we write down any of the things we've talked through, any questions they think of throughout the week, they'll add to that document and it's really become their sort of progression plan for the quarter. Um, so training we're doing once a week. Um, and then for... I do a group catch up um, when I'm first into the office in the week, which is basically how was your weekend? Just a social little get together, um, just an around the grounds really. And just if there's been anything they need do need to mention, or if there's any like updates for the business that they need to be across, like if we've got any things coming up um, and also what my week looks like and how available I'm going to be for them. Um, and then, yeah, an individual catch-up I'll do once a week just to see if they've got any questions about any files, um, if there's any IT issues or anything they've had along the way or um, because they're working with brokers who sometimes don't have the best notes and things like that, anything they want me to bring to the brokers that they may not feel comfortable doing as well. Um, it is quite hard to tell, a, to tell some staff your notes aren't enough, we can't read your mind. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I'm sort of got that casual catch up um, and then the individual chance for us to have a chat. And then with the specific teams, the admin and the customer care, we have a catch up where we just go through processes and everything like that as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, great little lesson, I think, for, for everybody. I suppose what I'd like to come to is you mentioned and obviously you've done it in the past and you made the decision that, you know, you, you know, that you wanted to form this admin team again and give it another crack. Um, yeah, okay to share with us what didn't work in the past and what you've changed to make sure it's successful since January, I suppose. And now you're up to four team members and what you then continue to do to make sure it's got continued success. Yeah. Yep. So I think, um, a big part of that is sort of the buy-in, the buy-in to the brand, the buy-in into the company, what loan gallery want to do, where we want to go, what we want to be, and how they're going to be a part of that growth. So um, it's, as you get to know your team, and I think that's why it is so valuable, and even just those social catch-ups, um, the one-on-one -on -one times, um, and even the training is to really understand how you can support that staff and make sure that you're really taking care of them and how they want to grow and move forward as well. So, um, yeah, I think I think the really big thing is um, for them having them, as Richard said, they were really proud to represent Profit Master at the, um, the gala event. They, I feel like they were all really proud. Um, and, again, we want, we want it to be their loan gallery and Profit Master. Um, so again, it's that buying for the brand, it's the pride in who they work for, and also knowing that we're going to support their opportunities for growth in open and honest conversations, um, whether it's, hey, I don't maybe like this aspect of my job, or the ne Filipinos will never outwardly say that, but it's more so like, what areas of the job are you really enjoying? What are you liking? And a lot of the time you can repurpose and push that focus there. Um, just to make sure that they are enjoying the day-to-day -day and you're getting the most out of your staff. Okay. So with you... Can I just comment on that, Paul? Yes, yeah. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, Rachel's exactly right. Uh, culturally, they, they tend to be a bit slow to speak up, particularly to an Australian. So one of the things that we've got, as you know, is we actually have team leaders in the office who these these people talk with every day. So the, the same... Uh, catch-ups that uh, that that Rachel's having with her staff one-on-one -on -one or group, it's slightly different the way they do it. But there's an opportunity for these people to actually speak with their team leader and and speak about any issues that they might have. And you know, virtually once a week we will get together as as a team ourselves and we look at where those concerns are and we look for very uh, you know we look carefully to see how we can resolve those and. The, the the system of having what Rachel has speaking to her staff the way they have, and then our team leaders speaking to the staff as well, works extremely well. Yeah, so and just to touch on that as well, Rich, I had the opportunity when I was over there to chat to the team leader that oversees um, my team in the Philippines as well, and we had a chance to sort of sit down, catch up and compare notes and really where I touched on how to support each team member, um, what's going to be 
the best opportunity for them to grow yeah. as well and to make sure that they're enjoying the role. And so, yeah, again, the conversations that they can have with their team leader there are going to be very different to the ones that are they aligned, have by the way? Sorry? Wait. With your with with your notes and and I don't know who your team leader is, but your notes and the team leader's notes aligned. Yeah, they were very similar. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, which was good. Um, but again, if you don't have sort of the time and um, if you don't have the time, like sort of I do to spend the one on one time as well, utilizing the team leaders there again. The uh, the conversations that they're going to have with their team leader will again be a lot more um I think a lot more honest in times um the good yeah. and the bad than potentially with an Australian client as you mentioned, Rich. Yeah. Mm. yeah well done. And look, congratulations to you. Obviously you've done a fantastic job in your short time being as the ops manager and obviously to Lone Gallery as well to to achieve what they've achieved in a short period of time as well, to go from one to four in a short period of time was pretty cool. Um, Rachel, we, we, when you restarted this process, I'm going to get to a question that Sally just asked as well. Just, But when you started this process for those that are considering this, and I know I've been considering it as well in terms of where, where did you start with your first team member? You knew some things hadn't happened as well in the past. The company had decided to write, we're going to continue this process down with an admin perspective. Where did you start the process? What was the series of tasks? Were they done internally first and you decided to write, create a job description or what was the first start of the process? Yeah, so what we actually built out was a process map. So um, for us, as rudimentary as we could get, which is call client, try to call client again, book appointment, just every step that comes along with the journey. Um, and then it was genuinely just highlighting what needs to be done by a broker, great. What needs, what can be done by someone else? What can you train someone else to? And it was a long list and it was breaking it down as granular as we could mm -hmm. and just deciding which genuinely needs someone, which probably needs someone in the meantime until people are trained up. So who a broker really doesn't need to waste their time doing these tasks because um, if you train someone well enough, they're going to do a good job at it. So that's really where we broke it down. Um, and then, yeah, building out training about the task specifically um, was really how we sort of stepped out what we were going to do. And then we built it into our CRM system. So um, with some um, Power Automate, um, just if one task is ticked off, a certain task will populate. If a file is selected as a certain kind of um, deal, a, like a few different tasks will populate. Um, but, yeah, it was really just breaking down every step that we can sort of take off um, the plate. And I think, yeah, Delia made the point, um, I think, in her comment about how, like, set tasks and processes. Um, again, knowing what you need to do with clear instruction um, is always going to be the most beneficial way for staff to learn until they sort of have that intuitive um, understanding of if this happens, then this. In the meantime, that needs to be stepped out. So, yeah, as much as it was it was time consuming and it was sort of a working group with um myself and three of our um top brokers where we genuinely did just step out as much as we could and we kind of went over again. It was with a highlighter and just said, Yep, this person has to do this, this person doesn't. And I suppose to be fair, because you put the hard work in at the front end, you're reaping the benefits off it down the track. Yeah, exactly. It was making sure that we had the plan, the processes in place rather than putting someone into a role um, with no idea how it was going to work. It's not setting them up to success. It's setting everyone up for frustration. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very good point. Um, I'm just going to come to a comment from Sally. And Sally, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and talk about this. But um, Sally's comment was, we have a team of five. We are struggling with staff speaking up if they are overloaded or don't understand something. We have stand-ups every day and frequent meetings. The culture difference is proving very difficult. There you go. I've just got a camera on as well. Um, sorry, you can speak on it, Sally, because you're you're finding the difficulty. So you these are team members that you've currently got working for you. So yes, we have five in the Philippines full time. Our we we've had quite a few teething issues. I've been doing this probably for a few years now in the Philippines. Um, Rachel, I completely agree. It's it's getting it down to granule, like just, which is a little bit frustrating because it um, it implies which is a correct um, which is correct to say that 
thinking outside of the box is not something that you're necessarily going to get from the Philippines. So if you want someone to really think, you have to probably go three, three stages above what you, so I'm bookkeeping. I would go to a chartered accountant over there to do the bookkeeping because I'm wanting something, somebody who can think. So where you target a bookkeeper here, over there you want someone who's at, at least a degree level. Um, but sorry, going back to my question there is um, I'm struggling with the culture. How, how do you deal with staff that don't necessarily speak up because there's so much shame involved if they can't do it them if they don't know how to do something and they have to think outside the box. That's where I'm struggling. Uh, I, maybe I could comment on that, uh, Sally. Sure. Um, uh, that degree issue, um, it's interesting if you're hiring people without degrees. Um, all of our bookkeepers, accountants, loan processors and professional staff have at least a degree of some sort. Um, then they may have a, a degree in accounting technology and then more, more particularly they will have a, um, a, a Bachelor of Accounting degree and many of them have their CPA licence. So um, that comes down to the selection of staff. We are very particular about who comes into Profit Master. They have to be able to, to qualify depending on the level that they're coming in at, but they have to qualify in terms of academic excellence. As, and then depending on where they come in, they have to qualify in levels of experience as well. Um, th the other thing is um, about having to go up to a higher level um, in terms of bookkeeping. Um, look, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, we bring our bookkeepers in at level one, two, and three. A level one bookkeeper is pretty well a graduate, maybe a year's experience locally, going to level one, at uh, level two, which would be one to three years experience uh, with some Australian experience. Level three would be an Australian experience bookkeeper. They would be able to take it all the way through <laughs> to trial balance preparation and would be experienced in indirect uh, tax filings such as uh, um, VAS and PAYG, and then would also be fit familiar with one, one, one touch superannuation and things like that. So um, it depends on where you're bringing the people in at. The other thing is that the feedback that you're getting from your people, um, I, I, I don't know if you're hiring through an organisation or if you're hiring directly, but if you're hiring through an organisation, your team leader should be able to assist you with those concerns that you have. And if they're not doing it, then the, the, they should have some sort of performance improvement program that would allow you to monitor that very carefully. And, you know, it's the old uh, saying, you know, um, uh, recruit carefully fire quickly. If they're not working for you, get rid of it. We actually offer a three-month staff replacement guarantee that if the staff are not performing at the level that you want, move them on. But we're finding, I mean, 70% of our staff are in the professional, uh, more probably, 70% of our staff are in the professional services area of bookkeeping and accounting. And, you know, I I just, they're not the same things that 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 your experience that, we're, that we experience. Now, I'd be happy to introduce you to one of our team leaders to have that discussion. Are so you dealing with a different culture to what I'm dealing with? It, I, I don't understand what you mean. So the, 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 the written question was, I'm yeah. having a problem with the culture and people yeah. are not actually speaking up. Yeah. They don't understand something or if they're overburdened with work. I don't mm. think that that's an issue with where I'm sourcing my staff from or the mm. level of qualifications that they have because I screen my staff quite well. I'm yeah. struggling with the cultural aspect. That yeah. In Australia, if we don't understand something, we'll say, well, I don't know and I want some more training and it's your responsibility to give me training. Or if I'm overwhelmed or I have too much work, we will speak up and say, not fair, I'm doing enough. Over there, there is shame associated with not being able to do a task that's been asked and not speaking up and saying, actually, I don't know how to do that. Mm. Well, that was actually the question that uh, when Rachel was discussing it and I was discussing it about the team leaders, you're quite right. Culturally, you'll find it difficult for a Filipino to tell you how they really feel and what's really on their mind until they get to know you very well. 
but they will certainly tell their team leader. That will be a much more honest discussion that you would probably be able to get than having direct discussions with them. And the team leader will open up very, they will tell you quite openly and honestly, the team leaders have 20 years experience. A young bookkeeper might only have one or two years experience. And I think right, um, just touching on quickly what Rich has said as well, um, it's, I think you you encounter it with a like new employee a lot, the sort of yes mentality, um, just having the, the openness and the like contactability to ask questions. I mean, my team will always start with a sorry, Rachel, but I have a question, but just or, like the positive reassurance with the question asking as well and always having the time. And then I think like we spent a lot of time very early on making sure that no knowledge was assumed, everything was written out. Because again, for, for someone who's like understands um, the obviously different industries, but for someone who understands how it goes when you go, you put an offer on a property and then you sign the contract and then you have settlement and I understand what a settlement is. Um, for someone fresh coming in, while they may have the written book experience themselves, the actual practical knowledge and how that works from a day-to-day um, a -day aspect, understanding the why behind the what um, can sometimes be a gap that we miss them bridging because they don't see the day-to-day -day why something happens. Um, so, yeah, again, it's... It, and again, I agree that a lot of the time, like the questions, um, it really took a while for them to feel really comfortable with asking the questions. But again, it was the positive reinforcement that I've always got time to answer questions. I'm always available for a call. So they don't feel like they're bothering because, again, in their mind, we're incredibly busy. That's why we need that's why we need these officers overseas to help us. So just the availability to make sure that when they do have a question, it's something that they don't feel burdened with asking, um, which, again, it takes a lot of time and as Richard said sometimes that depending on the person, they may never feel comfortable doing it with the client provider. It may need to be someone who they can have an honest chat with, um, even if it is like in Taglish, maybe because they can't express what they need to in English in the same way. Thank you. Uh, just comment there, uh, Vanessa, thank you very much for your comment there. I think that's uh, that says uh, loads about how we do it at ProfitMaster. But Sally, um, Aside from that, I know you don't have staff with us, but uh, if you wanted to have a, a chat on the side, either with Delia or I, um, and we'd be happy to share with you how we manage this stuff a bit better. Sure. Awesome. Well, thank you. Look, again, great questions. And that's what these are about, the ability to ask questions openly and have different views, I suppose. It's not just a one view. It's um, obviously Rachel's got a... a, a, a a total different view to what let's say Richard or someone else may have. So it's great that, and even someone like Vanessa, fantastic that, you know, those sort of comments come through and they're, they're, they're so important. So thank you. Um, just in 157. So just looking to wrap up a little bit. So Rachel, can I just come to you for one more thing? So um, what, what do you think in terms of wrapping up now, parting comments, what's the top three things that uh, a business, you know, that you can share whether it's one or two or three, doesn't really matter, but top three things that you can think about for it, the continued success moving forward with what you've developed at Loan Gallery. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think probably my three main things I touched on earlier is the continued opportunity to train and upskill as well. Um, people want to, people always want to be their best. And I think um, Filipinos as well, they always want to impress and do their very best job. And um, you'll find staff who really do want to either become experts in their field that they're in, or they want to build new skills. So offering training and offering up skilling, because um, you can find some real, you can find some real guns um, and some real areas that you didn't think people necessarily would be interested in that they want to come and specialize in. So offering that. Um, again, inviting collaboration with them on your workflow and processes. Um, we've made a bunch of process improvements off what our team has said um, because we've offered them that opportunity as well to say, we've built this out, but tell us, tell us if it doesn't work. Um, we've monitored the tasks that they've got going forward and seen if something's been taking a long time. We've sort of 
had the conversation, hey, like what's what's holding this up? What part of the process? What can make this move smoother? And uh, some of them have built out some templates to help answer questions and things like that. Um, and offering that opportunity, it's been a huge improvement for us because, again, um, they're the ones doing it. They know what works and what doesn't really. Um, and then, yeah, last thing as well is the culture. Um, yeah, I, I'm really... I really want to push the big cultural point of view. I think it's the Gen Z in me. We appreciate culture. We appreciate buy into our companies. We want to be aligned um, with who we're working for and who we're working with. So, um, yeah, making sure like our end of financial year party, we made sure we sent the team out for lunch that day in the Philippines because we weren't going to be working. Why should they? Um, just things like that, making sure they feel as a part of the team and some um, like as they are, as you mentioned earlier, it's like hiring staff here. It's just they're located somewhere else. No, it's a very, very good point. And I think just watching again, I, I had the pleasure of watching you engage with your team members. Um, and I think it was invaluable, you know, the, the the way that you did that. And that's probably something that, again, all businesses could learn from the way that you engage and you sort of immersed yourself in their culture. Um, as opposed to expecting them to immerse themselves into our culture, which is, you know, and I think that was that was very evident. I don't know, for, for those of you that were there, I know Domingos tried to do that with team members over there and he did it very well from what I saw. But it was, it's, it's, it's so important. It is just so important. Um, Rich, any yeah, other... Just say, yeah, go yeah ahead, sorry, mate. Yeah. I, I think we, we should just qualify that, that Domingos had a very good night on Friday night. <laughs> He's on mute. <laughs> Can't hear you, mate. But that's all right. That's all right. Um, Rich, any parting comments from you before we leave? No, I, I look, I, I think uh, just to, to dovetail in with what uh, Rachel just said, training is is most important. I mean, these are young, ambitious graduates who are wanting to grow in their professional careers, and uh, how you how you assist them to do that is the uh, is the thing that will give them uh, the longevity, the attitude, the, the culture, and all of that. And from our side of view, we provide 45 personal development courses. We provide, um, uh, uh, sorry, personal development courses, 45 personal development courses, including driver training if they want to. Um, and we also uh, have professional development courses. And then we also have team development courses as well. So this is all part of growing a uh, singular culture within the organisation that then can be shared with uh, with other cultural relationships, such as with Rachel, with Martin, with Vanessa, and so on. Yeah, well, Even with Delia, De with Delia's staff member as well, it's the same. Yeah, well said. I don't I don't want to leave without just addressing Des's question here. Are you going to talk about costs and hours worked? Um, look, I suppose the costs are going to vary, but it's probably something else. Uh, I suppose Rachel, you'll add a. Can you share a little bit sure. about the hours worked? I know Rich mentioned it before. They start early and they get lunches and so on, but the hours worked. Yeah, so um, so my team are full time. Um, so I'm in Melbourne. Um, so they're starting now with daylight savings. They start at nine thirty. Um, and they finish at six thirty our time. Um, so I think for their time that means they're up um working at six thirty a.m. Um, all of them. I've got a good morning teams message before they start then, and then they've got their hour lunch break as well. Um, where obviously they've got their um free lunch at Profit Master. Um, but yeah, they've got that sort of hour break there. So they're working a standard, I think it's 40 hour week. Okay. Brilliant. And I suppose I think it works out slightly less because of the huddle on Tuesdays. Okay. Yeah. And I suppose, um, Des, I suppose I'll I'll get dearly to follow up with you. I suppose that the cost is going to be dependent on the type of role you're looking for, I suppose. So that's a, a little bit more specific, but I'm sure dearly will follow up on that one. Anyone else got, would like to unmute and ask a question, please, please ask one before we look to wrap up as it's just gone 203 Melbourne time. It's funny saying Melbourne time and Queensland time and all these different <laughs> things. Small little Let's 25 million her. people and we can't get on the same page for the King's birthday and public holidays and school holidays and daylight saving. There's my rant for the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you look after yeah. LMG brokers? Anyone Des has asked okay. to look after LMG? No. So the answer to, to that question is not specifically no. Okay. 
mainly AFG, but we can we can manage and, and we have process maps for LNG as well. And I yes, think it's just parts... a case LNG has a, uh, a panel, so you just have to be approved on the panel and you keep having to renew that. So we have been, whether we're up to date right at the moment, I'm not 100% sure I can check, but each broker just uh, approaches the aggregator and we do a com submit some, some compliance submit some compliance documents um, just to get reapproval. So yes, we can work with LNG. Great work, great work. I think that covers most of our questions. Thank you to everyone that has joined us. A special thank you to Rachel McKenzie. Um, obviously sharing everything that you've shared has been priceless, I feel. And obviously to Rich for you joining us today. Thank you again to all of you that Pleasure, have joined us and um, shared comments, thoughts, ideas. Again, very much appreciated. And uh, look out for my next masterclass is on the 17th. So I'm doing a very special little masterclass with the chairman of Findex. So very rarely do you get access to people like this. Terry Paul is, um, he's very, very good. And he's very, very open about how he's been able to grow the Findex brand. So if you want to jump online, it's the 17th of October. It's a masterclass. We've extended it because we're going to go through a lot. Um, so Hopefully you've seen the invitation for that. If you haven't, hit me up and I'll make sure I'll send you the Zoom link to join us. It's free of charge for our next masterclass. To all of you, thank you. Signing off till I see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your Take day. Take care. Uh, thanks. See Dad. you guys. Bye-bye. Join us at Profit Master. Passionate people, passionate careers.